I need a, fresh, a refreshing reality. There are so many people that try to pick and poke and criticize and pick me off and, and all of that stuff, and some days it just plain ticks me off. Well, in case you haven't sensed that, I'm a little upset about it today. So um, all that to say is I need a refreshing reality. I need to hear of the goodness of God over the top of my inadequacies or my inabilities or my weaknesses or my failures or my disappointments or my setbacks. I need a refreshing of reality. Listen, we learned last week that as we were looking into 1 John in chapter 1, that the Christian life is not designed to be lived in isolation, but rather we learned that what John was teaching, the, the aged apostle, the last living apostle, that what he was teaching is, is that the Christian life was designed to be lived in fellowship with God and with others. And fellowship is one of those things that becomes very sticky because, because of sin. We divide ourselves and we divide against God and we do these things. It's not that we're not saved. It's not that... that you know, that, that, that our salvation is not secure, but, but it's our steps that get, that get broken up, that, that become the obstacle. And yet what John told us in 1 John chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, he says, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. I want that. I want fellowship. I want my joy to be full. You know, and some of the simple things that I've learned over the course of the years is that, you know, we can get into all these great Bible studies and we can talk about these things in church. And, I, and, 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 and maybe more specifically, I'm thinking back to my days as, a, as, a, as an early believer, but it really applies throughout the course of our life. That in the Christian life, that it is more often caught than taught. And I know that's a phrase that many of you have been, you know, that you've heard over the course of the years, but maybe we don't quite understand it. We, do, we don't bring it back to a linking element, and that is, is that, that it is during the moments of fellowship that, that many Bible truths are absorbed. We see other believers living these things out, and, 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 and man, God just, he speaks to us through those things. You know, I can remember being a, a, a brand new believer and my friend Kevin from San Diego, in, totally instrumental in, in, in uh, uh, ministering to me and seeing me come to the Lord and all that. But this brother modeled generosity in such a perfect way to me. It was, it was so powerful. I mean, even to this day right now, I mean, 30 plus years later, I still remember Kevin and his generosity. And Kevin did never, he never lectured me, he never, you know, took me aside and, you know, gave me some Bible teaching lesson or anything like that. But in his life, he demonstrated generosity. And by hanging out with Kevin, I, 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 I just learned that. I caught on to that. Kevin showed me how generosity is worked out tangibly in living you know, he, he, he had a ministry, and I was a part of his ministry, and it was, you know, we, we were ministering to, to uh, juvenile gangsters, uh, you know, mostly in the Hispanic community here, and, and, and the way his generosity flowed out towards those kids, it was infectious, man, and I want to live a life that is infectious, contagious, and today as we talk about a refreshing reality, please just understand that John is, he, he's teaching that fellowship with God it doesn't require for us to live lives of sinless perfection because we could never obtain that. That's, that's not what it's requiring. That's not what he's talking about. But he does desire that we live lives where we're honest and we're bringing our sin struggles to Jesus. And I think, that, I, I, I think that's a real test of humility is, is that am I willing to share with God what God already knows about me, the weaknesses that I have? Am I willing to respond to his loving truth and we come to the very first idea of the morning, and that is completely covered. Let me read to you 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. This is, this is what is written. John, the aged apostle, he says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous 
And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now, uh, by this, we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Now, he who says, I know him, and it does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word truly, the love of God is perfected in him. And by this, we are in him. He who says that he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. And brethren, I, I, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have already heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Now he who says that, that he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates or, or detests his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. And Father, I pray this morning that you would help us to have sight and that you would help us to understand what you have spoken, that you would be with us and that you would strengthen us. We look to you by faith. Holy Spirit, be our teacher. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So completely covered as I did, number one, is, 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 is it starts out in verse one. John is saying, he says, my little children, I, this, is, this is the phrase that John had. Remember, John was the oldest guy in the room anywhere he went, you know, at the age of, you know, somewhere about 90 years old or so, the last living apostle, the last living eyewitness of, of Jesus Christ, that, that there he is. And, 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 and this guy that was a son of thunder, that wants to call lightning down from the sky that God would destroy other people. He's the same guy that now here at this age of uh, having walked with, with the Lord and having seen and having ministered even after Jesus went on, ascended to heaven. Now his heart has changed in such a way as that he's addressing the people as, as my little children. The phrase literally means little born ones. So, so he's not... He's not, he's not going to that place of talking to like, you know, some of this two years old. That's not what he means. He's speaking collectively over the church as, as people that are born again. And he's using this affectionate term here, little born ones, or my little children as we're reading it in English. A phrase that he uses some nine times or so here through, through the chorus of this letter. He's doing that because the, the topics of which he is moving into is, is that he's touching lightly but pointedly so that folks would receive what God has for them. And, 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 and immediately out of the gate, he's, he's writing, as, as we've seen in chapter one, and even, know as, even now as it gets more magnified, he's writing in such a way that he's bringing these simple truths forward so what happens? That they inspire growth. That's why he's bringing these forward in the way that he's doing it. He wants to see the growth, my little born ones, my little children, people of the church. I'm not John. I didn't see Jesus, I didn't touch Jesus tangibly, physically in his humanity as John did. I haven't lived as long as John. I'm not an apostle like John. But I am a follower of Jesus Christ. And by the will of God and the grace of God, God has called me and he set me within this community in this particular fellowship to do something very specific. And I want to see the goodness of God come out of your life. I want to see your lives be fruitful. Now, I, 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 am, I, I, I don't have the same heart to go to this place and say, my little children, some of you are older than me, looking at me like, mm, you're my little child. Be quiet there, young man. <laughs> Yeah. But if we could take the age thing aside, I can tell you that I, that I do have the heart that I, that, 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 that once again, that, that, that I want to inspire you with the word of God, that you would respond to the grace of God and grow in the goodness of God in your life. That, that, that is, you know, that's why I stand here. When that evaporates, guess what? I'm gone. I'm leaving. Whether, whether it's reassignment by the Lord or I step out the door myself. But, but, but if I no longer have a passion to give to you the goodness of God and to pour out into you, I'm not going to stand before you. I get tired in the work just like you do. But I am not tired of the work. 
I am so excited to bring you God's word. You know, some of you are in the school of ministry. Some of you come to Wednesday nights. Sometimes you get me two and three times a week, and you're going, holy cow, I can't handle this guy anymore, man. I need some time off. Well, don't take the time off because Jesus is always here for you. And there's wonderful fellowship here. But this morning, if you're struggling with your Christian life, if you're struggling with walking it out, this message is for you. If you have become faint-hearted, if you have become dull emotionally and mentally, if you're slowly re removing your hand from the plow, then listen, you're not the only one in the room that feels that way. You're not the only one that struggles. We are living in crazy times. And the intensity of spiritual warfare, I think it has blighted the church in such a way is, is that we become numb, dull, and ineffective, and that's exactly what Satan wants. That's how he wants the church to respond, ineffective. And I, I, I think that, that many times that we miss the reality of spiritual warfare that's going on. And Satan does a great job at distracting us which is part of spiritual warfare. Because if he could pull you out of the routines and that closeness of your relationship with the Lord, then he's succeeded. And it's, a, it, it, it's an attack upon you as an individual. Look at verse number one one more time. Again, he goes, my little children. He says, these things I write to you so that you may not sin, okay? And if, if anyone sins... We have an advocate with the Father. He's writing so that we may not sin, so that we may not remain in this habitual process of living a life of sin. And he says that, that, that if we do sin, remember what he, what he said in the previous chapter, he says that if we confess our sins, he also said that if you say you have no sin, you make God a liar. He, he, you know, he shared all these things with us. But now his point is coming to something else. It's coming to this advocacy. You know, it, 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 it's, it's a phrase that we often use around our, our courts or our legal system and all that stuff. But in the scripture, it means nothing more than, you know, it's speaking of a helper. It's speaking of the Holy Spirit. The paracletus that, is, that, that comes alongside. We, we, we've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. While Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father, and this advocacy, I guess, specifically here, this help specifically, it will refer to what Christ is doing even in this present moment. He's making intercession for the saints in those areas that where you and I are blowing it. And we have the promise, the seal right now that, that, that the Holy Spirit is within us. It's a guarantee that God is going to bring to pass what he said. But as it pertains to the advocacy or the advocate very specifically here in this verse, listen, maybe some of you have been taught that this is a defense attorney. And, 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 and I think that's a good example of this. You know, a defense attorney that's coming to your aid and now, now, this is Jesus. Jesus is standing in the gap. Jesus is, is saying to the, to the Father that I paid for that. And when you or I sin, either past, present, or even future, yet what's to come, we understand that the, the, the advocate of Christ, the help of Christ, the defense attorney, as he, as he lives and he makes intercession for us at the right hand of the Father right now in this present moment, that God is actively doing something amazing for you and I that God has not taken his hand off of us. And as we continue to walk within a fallen world, we're still learning how to, to, to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We're still learning. It takes a lifetime to learn how not to have confidence within the flesh. Because our natural default reaction is, is that it's broken, I'll fix it, get out of the way. I'm gonna do it. I have a note here for Romans chapter 8. I don't remember what it is, but they'll throw it on the screen here for you. Uh, Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 33, it says this. Paul writing, he says, Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God. Oh, here it is who also makes intercession for us. That Jesus is making intercession for us. Now, 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 now practically, or, 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 or should I say scripturally, you've probably heard that many times throughout the course of your Christian walk. You probably, maybe, maybe you know those verses. Maybe, there, maybe there's some memory verses and all that stuff. 
But when it gets down to the practical results, I think that we detach some of the Old Testament and the New Testament, and we don't, we don't really see some of the practical results. We don't remember. Uh, if you have a Bible and you're able to do some Bible Olympics, uh, I would encourage you to, t- to flip just briefly uh, to Psalm 23. If not, take a look at the screen because they're going to have it on the screen here for you. And if you would remember just, just, just some of the practical, practical results that in Psalm 23, a psalm that we often, you know, we, we, we think about hard times, we think about death, we think about all of these particular things, but, but it's still describing the character of God. And a practical thing of Christ making intercession for us, what happens to me practically right now in, on, on October 1st of 2023 in this world, what happens to me? Psalm 23 and 3, it says this, he restores my soul, or, or literally he refreshes He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. For it is God that has done that then, written in the Old Testament, looking forward to the divine shepherd of Jesus Christ, the Psalm of David. And it is now that Jesus, he he sits at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you and I. And practically the result is, is that he refreshes my soul. And gang, that should be why you're coming to church, is so that you could see Jesus and worship Jesus in a corporate capacity to receive from Jesus to serve Jesus, all of these things are happening. But, 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 the, but the personal benefit, the personal takeaway is, is that, that he refreshes, that he restores your soul. We go through the week, we get tired, we get weary, we get busted up, we get, we get all of these things. And, and hopefully when we come in on Sunday and we open up the word of God, that, that, that here we're confronted with the, with, with the promises of God and we sense the power of God working in us personally. Personally, God working in you personally. Second practical result is also there in the uh, book of Psalms. Um, and while Psalm 23 is a Psalm of David, we advance to Psalm 51, also a Psalm of David. Uh, and they'll put these verses on the screen. Psalm 51, verse 10 to 12. That David, after having been caught in this place of walking away from God and running from him for about a year and all this stuff, and in and, and, and through this exchange, I'm only going to read part of it to you, that through this exchange, he comes to this place in verse number 10, and he says, he says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me, and do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. You know, the NIV puts verse number 12, uh, grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. I like that. I like the way, I like the, way the NIV says that. Lord. God, grant me a willing spirit. But don't miss it. Don't miss that it, that it is God that is doing the cleansing here. That, that, that this creation, that, that, that you know, this, this, this word, again, Psalm 51 and 10, this word create right here, this is the same word that is used in Genesis 1 and 1. And, and, and this create, this is, this is God making something out of, of complete nothingness, right? When he created the world, it was like complete nothing. Like God made something out of nothing. And this created me a clean heart. You know, basically David is saying, hey, there's nothing good that dwells within me. There's nothing here that is salvageable. God has to do that fresh work of creation. And what does the Bible tell us in the New Testament? That we're new creations in who? In Christ, new creations. This is, this is David's cry. Clean heart, restored joy. Now, if we dig farther into the Old Testament, should you desire to follow along, we have Isaiah chapter one. This may be on the screen as well. But Isaiah chapter one, we see Isaiah, that, that he, he, is, he's, he, he, he gave a, a, a message to the people for the Lord, a people that were distracted. Many of you know that. But what's fascinating is what he says is in verse 18 and 19, he's communicating for God to the people. And he says, come now. God is saying this. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. That though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. And though they are are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. And he moves on down. But this is God reasoning. This is God crying out. This is God pleading. This is God speaking through Isaiah. You know, God has spoken in the New Testament through Jesus Christ. 
that, 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 that the Spirit of God has given a word to the message of the, uh, you know, to the apostles. And we have all these letters. This morning, the Spirit of God speaks to me through His word as I, as I become just a communicator of His word. And God is saying, come now, let us reason together. And he says, though your, your sins are like scarlet, right? I, I, we, we read that, we can get that. But the fabric of the time in the days of antiquity was like, like this was a piece of, piece of cloth that was double dyed. And the idea is, is that, that, that you're not getting that out. I don't care how much tide you squirt on there, blood remover, stain remover, greasy stuff remover. It's not coming out. God's acknowledging the fact that, the, that this, this double dyed, this, this, though your sins are like scarlet, that it is so deep, it's not going anywhere. And why you might be a new creation and why, why, why we have the Holy Spirit to help us to, to abide in Christ and to bear fruit unto the Lord, there's still the very real, real aspect that in your humanity, that sin is still there. And we need to talk about sin and we need to be encouraged and reminded that how good God is because we can often fail ourselves as good little Christians we set up these standards, we set up these things, when we break those things or those standards or those routines, we, you know, we, we, we look at ourselves in such a bad way. And God wants us to have this understanding to, that, that practically speaking, that we would get his heart and that practically speaking, that we would understand that he desires to restore or refresh my soul, that he desires to cleanse my heart, that he desires to restore my joy. These are all things that I need. And I, I hope that you're able to acknowledge that within your life, that you need those things too. That we need to have this right fellowship with God. And as we look in the, into the New Testament, you know, maybe another example of, of, of the uh, advocacy of Christ uh, would be Luke 22. Let me see this. This is all about... Um, Remember our, our dear friend, our dear brother, Peter. But in Luke 22, I think it'll be on the screen here for you. Uh, verse 31 and 32. The Lord said, Simon, Simon. So Jesus, he said, Simon, Simon. Check this out, guys. You know this. Indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. That Jesus prayed that Peter's faith wouldn't collapse, but that the sifting would make Peter stronger. And if you can receive this by way of understanding, just a simple truth right here, if you could receive this, can you recognize that growth happens best in sifted soil? In other words, the reason that God allows us to go through these places to where we are sifted is so that we come to the end of ourselves. Are you at the end of yourself here today? Oh, you're a good Christian. Oh, you're saved. Oh, you're in the church. Oh, you show up to church. Oh, you read your Bible. Oh, all of those things. Right. But that's not the question that I asked you. I didn't ask you what your routines were. I, I, I said, are, are, are you ready to come to the end of yourself? That's a real question. The second idea, and we're going to wrap early today. The second idea, flipping back to 1 John, is the defense is on my side. Verse number two. And he himself, Jesus, he himself, is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Propitiation, here's another one of those words that is not so common. We don't really use this word in our English language. But if you could receive it, in ancient times, they used this word often and frequently. Because people believed that their idols or their little gods were angry, and they were unpredictable. And, 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 and this led to a superstition that, that, that people were trying to satisfy all kinds of unknown gods, and they would do these religious 
efforts and they would make these religious sacrifice. That's what was called the propitiation. They were doing this to satisfy an unknown God that was angry and unpredictable. This was propitiation. The New Testament writers, they take this and they turn this and they capture the phrase, but they pour a different meaning into it. And when they get to this place of, of, you know, where John is doing right here, he says propitiation. What happens is, is he's turning this and he's focusing it on the kindness of God through Jesus Christ. That now we have peace with the Father because of what Christ has done. Because Jesus was the, the, the perfect offering that satisfied God's holy law, God's holy wrath. And, 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 and instead of being a word that is, that is strung with a whole bunch of uncertainty, the New Testament writers, they take this and they anchor this down to complete certainty. That in Christ, that because of Christ, that he's paid that price for our sins. Not only ours, but also for the whole world. In other words, anybody that would be willing to accept the gift of grace. And last week we enjoyed, we, we loved the heart of God last week in, in, in what we were seeing here in 1 John 1 and 9, that if we confess our sins, that he's faithful and he's just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we unpacked all of those things. You know, we, 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 by way of application, we talked about a kite string, right? That, that God forgives us, that, that, he, that he takes those areas of our life, just like a kite string that, you know, you lose the kite, it falls down on the ground, it gets caught in a tree and it gets all tangled up and all that stuff, that, that we see God taking those knots that are there and, and he unties the knots. He gets them out. But when our way collides with God, our hearts condemn us. And John will address that here maybe in a week or two of saying that God is greater than our heart. So when our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows all things. And we come to the final idea here of this morning and that is idea number three and that is uh, the obstacles are, are Satan and self. The two obstacles that are there Satan is masterful at condemning us. He sets us up with pleasure, and then all of a sudden he pulls the rug out from underneath of us with guilt. That's it. You know, James tells us about this, you know, about temptation, that he draws us out into this place of the open space. He lures us out. He seduces the weaknesses within us. Again, not new information to you guys. You know that. But he's masterful at giving us this, these, these, these pleasures in the moment. And the pleasures in the moment, it doesn't have to deal, it doesn't have to just be exclusively down dealing with the, you know, the, the big things of sin. Many times it can be the motivation of the will where he seduces you. Many times it can be the, it, 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 can, it can be the entertaining of an ongoing thought it leads you away from God instead of to God. So for those of you that are more critical and more, more uh, uh, maybe need the sprinkling of God's love uh, more in, in, in certain areas of your life so you're, so you're not so uh, snappy at other, other, other Christians or you're not so entrenched to the, uh, you know, with ideas that, well, I got these things down. I'm living a basic good Christian life. Cool, awesome, okay. Uh, but realize that, that, that the word of God is going much deeper than that. You know, and, and, and it is expected that as you grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, you have birth, but then you move on and you, you grow up. It is expected that you, that you will turn away from these big external acts. And, 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 and the more that you mature in Jesus, the more the, the struggle becomes an inward battle of motivation and thought and, 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 and what's going on on the inside of you. This is, this is why we're to put on the helmet of salvation. This is why we're to test all thoughts, bring every thought into obedience in the captivity of Christ. This is, this is why... Paul gives us this in the book of Ephesians because that battle turns into that place. It's in that space between my ears and I can obey and I can reject God right in that space within my thoughts. It all happens in the privacy of inside of me and the only thing that God sees and not the people that are around me that see. And so for those of you that think that, well, I've heard this thing and, you know, I've, I've gone through the Bible so many times and I've been in church for so long, right, you are the perfect candidate to, be, to, to become or to fall shipwreck 
because you think that you've heard these things and you think that you have them down and you're only dealing with the outside, forgetting to look on the inside. In other words, look into the mirror. Look into the perfect law of liberty. Look into the word of God. Look into the life of Christ. And what is God speaking to you personally in that space between your ears, in your mind, in your emotions, in your desires, in your motivation? What's happening there? Just because you can put on your Sunday best and come through the door doesn't mean that you're not selfish and self-serving. It just means that you showed up to church. But the issues are still there. And, and, and what John is giving to the church, my little children, my little born ones, is that he wants them to know something better. He wants them to grow up. He wants them to realize that they shouldn't be lying to other people. They shouldn't be lying to their self. And if they say they have no sin, they're straight up lying to God. That was the end of last week. He wants them to understand and to realize that, that, that we can bear these things out to God honestly in prayer and allow God to work that transformation in because the transformation comes is I absorb the word of God, the will of God, the understanding of, of what God has said within his word, and the transformation happens little by little. God is the one that is working that out. Suddenly I view things differently. I think differently. God is doing that. And I'm in this place of fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And as I speak, it's like, oh man, boom, there's a word of God. Oh, oh, I know where that applies to the scripture. Boom, oh, oh there's another word of God. Oh, I, I know where that goes in the scripture. That you're going through your, the course of your day and in the conversations you're having, the things that you're walking through, you're just seeing the word of God. That's the transformation that is happening. And the danger for those of us that start to get up a little bit, uh, that start to creep in age, and yes, I'm putting myself in your bucket too at 52 years old, so I know I'm realizing I'm removing half of the room. Good. I'm speaking to those that are above 50, okay? The danger that happens to us is that, 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 that we know these things, but we're not living these things. That, that we know these things, but in, 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 in that, that private space between the ears, again, we're in that place where our minds are defiled before God. But nobody else sees that. And Satan is so masterful at condemning us. He sets us up with pleasures. He pulls the rug out from underneath of us. And then he points a finger at us with guilt. And the Bible says that Satan accuses us before God day and night. Revelation 12 and 10. Why? Because he's trying to hinder your life on all fronts. And he's trying to get you to give up on God. Do you realize that the objective of Satan is to kill, steal, and destroy? Now, 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 now put that. The, right, if you can consider writing this out. The objective of Satan is to kill, steal, and destroy, and put your name at the end of that, Jeff. He's after you. Oh, oh, that is so extreme. But is that not what the Bible tells us? That every day, that Satan goes to and fro throughout the whole earth looking whom he may devour? Is that not what the scripture says? It does say that. But we don't like to, we don't like to get to that point of, of, of really recognizing those things because that makes me uncomfortable. Well, I'm not here to, to make you uncomfortable. But if we could shine a little bit of light on the truth, maybe we would understand this. Maybe we would understand the grace of God a little bit better because Jesus knows that Satan is up to this. And his grace spills out in such a way that covers over that where, where, where sin abounds, that grace abounds much more because Jesus knows that we're out duped between Satan and our flesh. There is no hope in that. But the overcoming aspect is, is the wild card. <laughs> I can't even call it a wild card. It's just, it's just Jesus Christ on my side. That's the overcoming aspect. And maybe here's the wisdom for, for us in the moment. Uh, this will be on the screen, Revelation chapter 20, uh, verse number 10. I don't know when the last time is that, that I read this verse to you, but I'll give it to you here this morning. Revelation uh, 20 and 10, it says this. It says, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and they will be tormented day and night forever. He loses. The Satan loses. 
Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Take a look at the screen, NLT. It says it this way. Or it says something different, but it says this. It says, and I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. The work in your life that God is up to, it is not finished. It's not over. And, and, and these words, while pieces and parts are familiar, and pieces and parts you've heard, the big context of, of, of everything that we're walking through is making sure that we underscore once and again the reality of what Christ is doing, has done, and will continue to do for you. We're underscoring that. These fundamental facts, these truths, these things here that, that John wrote, my little children, this stuff that he lays out, all of these things that are here, they're for you and they're for me, and it's so that we do not lose heart in the battle that is at hand. It's so that we don't become complacent and negligent in the great salvation that we've been given. Is that we would continually be stirred up to love and to good works. Yes, that is what Paul, that is what Peter, this is, this is what these guys brought forward to the church over and over and over and over again. But when I, when, I, when I lose a heart for God, I lose my attention and my motivation and my desire to grab hold of these certain truths. I go to the place where I come to church and it's a oh, yawn fest. I'm yawning, I'm asleep. Maybe, maybe my eyes are open, but mentally and emotionally, I've already checked out. I've heard this before. It doesn't apply to me. And therein, my friends, is where, watch, the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. The rocking of Satan puts you to sleep, and you don't realize that you're on a slippery slope and that he's got you duped. And the necessity for the re-preaching of these things and, 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 and for us to be confronted with the, the loving facts that, that God is for us and not against us, simple message, basic message, is so that we don't lose sight. And when you're in the middle of a war, you need to be reminded of these things. The simple truths, we must come back to them. And you are in the middle of a war. And the spiritual warfare that is going on around you is knocking Christians and knocking churches off left and right every single day. And there's such a strange dynamic that is happening right now. And if you're tuned in to what's going on spiritually, it's like things are moving so fast that I can't keep up. There's so much work to be done in the body of Christ for, for, for the lives, in, or rather in the lives of believers and for those that will yet come to faith. And because of the trickery of Satan, he's got so many Christians hemmed up on the sideline that they're not actively within the game anymore. Well, if you were a Broncos fan and you liked the bad score, fourth quarter wouldn't mean much to you. It's like, okay, uh, there's no coming back from this. But if you're in the biggest game of your life and you are down to that last couple moments, you know, maybe the two-minute warning has happened there. The game is still being played. Who's going to win this baby? Maybe the analogy breaks down because we know that we win in Christ. But I'm speaking of the motivation not to give up. I don't just sit on the sidelines. I don't just say, who, uh, you know, who really cares? I'm in the game, man. I'm showing up and I have to go back to the fundamentals of whatever I learned in football and put those in place in that moment. And the same thing is true for the facts of the faith. But the reality and the comfort that we take away is that those who are in Christ, just like what we read in, in Philippians 1 and 6 up there, is that you're going to make it. Because you coming to the end zone is not about your labor and your effort. It's merely about accepting what Christ has done for you. And for that, we can rejoice. But as we close, know this. As we read through the Gospels, every time Peter put his his own efforts in place. Every, every time he relied upon himself, his own 
strength, his own wisdom, whatever, he would fail. He would fail. Jesus would show up and help him. Whether it's Luke chapter 5 or John 21, again, the same examples are there. You know, Peter's go-to thing was, I'm going fishing, man, because I know how to do that. But even in that fact of going fishing, that would be his work, by the way. And when he was wrestling against God, he was unfruitful in that aspect. But when Jesus was leading, whether it's Luke 5 again or John 21, Jesus speaks up and he says, hey, cast the net over here off the right side of the boat. And bam, you know, instantly fruitful. So today, as the worship team comes forward, Today, the, the, wow, that was a fast light turn off right there. <laughs> Dead gum. You couldn't, couldn't land that baby fast enough over there. John's whole point is this, is that we would understand that fellowship with God is maintained through the work of Jesus Christ in a surrendered life. That's the whole thing. That we would let Jesus lead our life and I hope, I hope that you have, I hope that you have found in the scriptural truths here this morning a refreshing reality confronting us, strengthening us, helping us, pointing us back once and again to the simple things. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Amen?